this is going to be will probably end up as a longish video describing the issues surrounding with putting in new rain gardens. Rain gardens are a little bit tricky because we have to match the capacity of the rain garden to the amount of water that's coming down above the area. And we don't know the amount of water until we run our full uh, model on Model Builder to calculate the um, net rainfall and the amount of absorption. And those things will change as we add other features. But since rain gardens are one of the less expensive methods to reduce our flow, we either save them to the end, in which case we'd have higher costs, or put them at the start, and then have our calculations change. So the rain garden may be too big or too small, depending on what happens. Plus, we're doing our analysis for two different rainfall levels. And so what works for one rainfall level isn't going to catch all the rain at a higher level. To manage the number of runs that the undergraduates have to do, especially because they don't have the full model builder model of their analysis, they can't do a ton of runs. It just it's not likely that you'll be able to get done in time. So I'm saying it's okay for the undergrads to do some back the envelope calculations, but whatever you do, you have to make sure you check at the end that you're giving proper credit for the amount of water that your rain gardens catch. And so I'll go through that in this example. So this is a watershed around the study area, but it's actually a larger watershed than the one that you're, the <clears throat> one south watershed that you're using. You have a north watershed in addition. So that this has a different pour point shouldn't alarm you. I've actually moved it down just so it doesn't confuse you with the work that you're doing. But the principles are the same. The steps are going to be the same. So here's my main outlet pour point, and I've calculated the watershed for it. It's shown here. And the first thing I've done is added canopy. Now, I didn't add all the canopy down at the base and in a few areas up in the watershed area because I wanted to leave room for adding the additional rain gardens and the pour points associated with those rain gardens. So I'll turn off this uh, combined canopy and this watershed. Now, I have also calculated the streams when I calculated the rain garden. Maybe I'll put the watershed back on. When I calculated the flow for siding rain gardens. And so here I have basically the uh, outside area and the main stem. Now, there are various ways you could build in rain gardens. You can start from the bottom and go to the top, or start from the top and go to the bottom, trying to get outside edges. I just put in a set. So here's an example set of rain gardens, and I've named them. You can see here that this is Bailey and this is Lot 1. Those are the pore points associated with the rain gardens. And then the physical rain gardens themselves I've put in. You can see here I've digitized these polygons into their own layer, a separate layer from anything else. Uh, you don't have to modify them into, for example, the permeability layer. That over <clears throat> um, really complicates things. And to make it easy to manage, basically, I have here my pour point table, and I have a name with a pour point ID. I should maybe sort these by the ID. So there's the outlet and Buford Circle and Lot 1. Each of these corresponds to a rain garden in the map. So here's Bailey and here's Lot 1. I'll turn off the rain garden added so you can see that, in fact, that's what they show. And so here I have these names for these points. And then in addition, for the added rain gardens, I've matched those names and those pore points, right? So what I've done is basically made sure that I have a corresponding name and number in the point layer for the pore points and in the rain garden layer. Now I do this because later on, I'm going to have to compare the area of the rain garden, and hence the amount it can store, with the amount of water that I calculate that actually comes off of this watershed. So <clears throat> a couple of things that help me size these rain gardens initially. First, from the previous work in the unmitigated conditions, I know on average over the this watershed area roughly, how much water gets produced per unit square meter. It's about 0.012 to 0 0.015, or about 1.2 to 1.5 centimeters. Now, of course, it's going to vary by the watershed, but that gives me a ballpark, right? If I have an area that's 
mostly grass and trees, it'll produce less. If I have an area that's mostly buildings, it'll produce more. But at least that gets me a ballpark because remember the volume that's going to come off of this watershed is about the area times the average flow. And so, so I don't make this 10 times too big or one tenth the size it needs to be. If I calculate an area times 0.5, that gives me the area that I need. So the volume here that I have to get off of this. But then how do I know how much volume is going to come off of these? Well, um, I can look at a couple of things. So if I do my flow accumulation, if I've done a flow accumulation for my study area, right? I can take a look at that flow accumulation here in my study area and look at a point, right? By querying with this explore what the flow accumulation is in any one location, right? And it'll give me the flow accumulation at that location. So, um, I can basically zoom in to any point where I want to put a um, a water shed feature, a new pour point, uh, one of these rain gardens, and I can say, well, what is the flow accumulation at that point? Now, I have to remove this vector um, runoff so that I can see at that point about what the flow accumulation is going to be, and it gives me a flow accumulation value. Um, and so I get the area above and the area below for the flow accumulation vector, right? So here, um, if I look at the value at this point that's located on the output stream, I get a value of about 7593 square meters above that at, at 0 0.012 times this 7,000, I can calculate a volume. In this case, it's, I think, going to be about 800, um, I'm sorry, 80 cubic meters of water that comes down here. And so I can get a rough idea by clicking on the flow accumulation along one of these flow paths to show how much water I'm going to get. So if I was thinking about putting a, a a rain garden here, I could click on this flow accumulation cell and it tells me how much I'm getting. Or on this one here, it tells me basically the area above. And so I can get a ballpark estimate by multiplying the average flow over that whole watershed. Again, it's not going to be true, but it'll give me an idea. So that's one way to decide, well, roughly how big should I make them? And that guided my sizing of these. So I looked at the amount that was coming off. And you'll get different sizes depending upon the size of the upstream area that gets drained. That's why sometimes maybe sticking to these side branches helps because you don't have to worry about upstream downflowing into the downstream downflowing into more downstream as much. You still have to consider uh, ones on the main branch. You still have to do the analysis I'm going to show, but it helps in the initial size. I think you'll notice is that I put larger ones in where I could down below anticipating there'd be a, a lot of water I couldn't catch. So I put these in then, and I calculate their areas. So by calculating the areas of each of these, I can then run my full analysis and get my flow with these as my new pore points. If I run my analysis and get my flow with these as my new pore points, then it's going to give me a set of watersheds that are associated with the rain gardens. And so if I look at that set of watersheds, here's the watershed. Each of these watersheds is associated with the rain garden. So this rain garden catches from this area here and nothing flows out. So the calculation here, this rain garden catches this area here. And so when I sum my runoff, so I in my analysis, I've calculated this runoff amount here. So here's the a level of runoff. So off the building, we're getting a lot of runoff, and and down below, we're not getting very much runoff. So the values go from zero to two point five centimeters. This is two point five centimeters. So you can see that some places we get a lot of runoff, some places we get no runoff, and the runoff depends on the surface covering and whether the building is a green roof and the amount of forest canopy that gets accumulated down to this location, and so. In that zonal sum that I do for the runoff, I'll get a value. And the problem is I have to make sure 
that I don't have a larger rain garden to capture more than that runoff. And if there's more runoff than the capacity of the rain garden, I have to basically calculate the difference. As an example, suppose this watershed right here had a capacity in the rain garden to store 200 cubic meters of water. But off this watershed, I only got 100 cubic meters. That would mean then that zero comes out of this, and that's fine. But suppose this watershed here generates 500 cubic meters of water, and the rain garden only has capacity for 150. That means of that 500, only 150 is going to get caught, and I have to somehow take account for the extra 350 that's going to come downstream. And so what you'll have to do is say, how much surplus? This has zero surplus in our scenario. This has a surplus of a 350. So I have to come down and see the next one, because this is on the main stem. It's 150, I'm sorry, 350 extra. Does, has this reached its capacity? Suppose this hasn't, and there's an extra 50 here it could store. Well, 50 of that 350 gets caught here, and 300 transfers down. If, on the other hand, this has overflowed its capacity for the part that's in here and not captured in this, and has an extra, let's say, 120, I have to add that 120 to the 350, and now I have 470 that comes down to here. So you have to actually by hand transfer down the surplus. If there is no surplus, if you get to a point and there's a large capacity and it takes everything that's come down and there's zero surplus, you start again, and you see if this one can capture what drains into it. So I have to look at the capacity of each rain garden versus the amount of water that gets generated down to that location. And I physically have to follow my set down looking at the map. I can't do this automatically in ARC. But I can do a bunch of calculations in ARC that make that easier. You can see why the undergrads especially don't want to do this a bunch because this is all done by hand, right? Every time they run the model, they are running the model by hand. And so you can't do this a bunch of times. It's just it's too much work. You can't put in a rain garden and see how much you put in a rain garden. So my recommendations are you do these ballpark back of the envelope calculations where you have a really big surplus of space. You, know, you made it way too big. You can maybe reduce it some. If it's too small by a little bit or too big by a little bit, let's say 20% of the capacity of what's going into it, just leave it, right? Put them in, run it once, and then if you have extra to get out after you put in the rain gardens, use other things like converting a pervious surface or green roofs and run it a second time or maybe a third time. You don't want to run this more than three times at a level. So you do that the two and a half and you see what happens. <clears throat> Whatever's left over at the end, just put in underground storage. Right, so you run it maybe twice at the two and a half or three times at the two and a half. For the five centimeter, take where you start at the two and a half and enlarge things if you can. If not, then add more green roof and more pervious surface and then calculate it and adjust sizes. So don't run it more than two, at max three times for each rainfall level. It's just too much work, but ju be judicious. You are going to get graded by how close you get to getting these all to zero and how expensive it is. If you've just not paid much attention and just put in a bunch of underground storage and put in a bunch of grain roofs and really didn't worry about the placement of these, I know you haven't thoughtfully considered this and actually run through the set of calculations you need and practiced the model builder models so that uh, that's going to count against you. So I want a good faith effort, but I don't want to kill you by doing multiple, multiple times through. So what kind of analysis do you have to do? <clears throat> well, I have, again, a model builder model here that shows this. So and we come in with this zonal sheds. When you're done with all the mitigations you're going to do the first time through and you run it, you get this zonal shed calculation. And that gives you this zonal shed field, right? The zonal shed field basically is the output from your study area, and it shows how much output you get, right? The sum from each of these. Now, this value is the 
particular rain garden feature, and here's the sum. That's how much water is going to come to each of those. You can also then look at your rain garden added data layer, right? And so I'll open the rain garden added data layer attribute table, and I get then an area, right? So I can use this area then for the size of that rain garden and divide that by two to get a, a value that's the capacity. And then I can compare this capacity to that zonal sum. So for rain garden two here, right, there's a certain capacity. It's this divided by two or about 180. I can go then to the rain garden shed, I'm sorry, to the zonal sheds output, the runoff, and I can see for two, it generated way more than that, 380. I'm going to have a surplus of about 200 cubic meters of water at that rain garden too, right? So at this example, poor point ID2 at the Buford Street one, it's not holding what it should. On the map, what you can do is you can look at these basically from top to bottom. So I can go here in the, um, in the top point, the top one, at Bailey and see how much surplus there is or not. And in this one, see how much surplus there is for each individual in Buford and see how much surplus there is or not, depending upon what is just draining to it. Then when I have those differences, plus or minus, I can then walk down and keep track, adding the extra values. So uh, basically what I do in my, my project here is I have the zonal sheds input, that's the amount, and the rain guarded added, and I'll join those Right, so manually I would do that by opening the data table here. So here's the rain garden added data table. And then you can join fields on those, right? So in the table for the rain garden added here, I can go do a join and relate and add a join where I will join the zonal sheds to it. So that way I have for the same point both the area, and I can create a new um, a new column, which I will call the capacity column, right? And then I could count, I could calculate a um, basically a difference between that capacity and the sum. So here's the sum. That's when I join these two tables together. This is what I get. This is the sum that comes from that zonal sheds with the rain garden capacity. And so I can then. Uh, compare those two in this table to table join. I can add fields, right? So in this add fields, if I look here in my analysis, what I'm doing is I'm at a field called a rain garden capacity and an overflow. So if I add both of these fields, a rain garden capacity and overflow, I can then calculate those fields. So um, the rain garden capacity is the shape area divided by two. And then the rain garden overflow here is the difference between the sum that comes from my zonal statistics minus that rain garden capacity and that gives me the overflow. And so that will I, that's what I get in each of these points. As I move down, it, it would be the sums that I combine. And so I'll, uh, I'll run the model to then show how we might do that. Okay, so after I run my model, I then get this combined layer. So this combined or combined table really it comes from layers and a sum. So the um, the combined table takes this rain garden added. So these rain gardens here gets the area, calculates half that area to get the volume because remember they're 0.5 meters deep. So that is the capacity of a rain garden. It then takes the values for each of these sheds that drains to the rain garden pour point and it sums this runoff over those areas and so I get those two tables right the one from the sheds the one from the rain gardens I go ahead and join the tables here I then convert the table to an output table I add fields for capacity and overflow, and then I calculate that overflow, and I end it with a table that looks like this. So here I have basically 
for each of my pore points, 2 through 8, Buford Street through Brown 2, I have these areas for them. The capacity, which is half of that area. Right? The sum that comes from the sum across the, the zonal sum across the watershed zones that correspond to each of these pore points. And then the overflow, which is basically the sum minus the capacity. And so what I'm doing here is this is 203 cubic meters of extra water that comes out of this Buford Street rain garden. So if I look at the Buford Street rain garden, there's 203 extra coming out of that just from the area that it drains. Now that doesn't count any additional that comes from these two upstream watersheds. So I have to look at the Bailey and the Lot 1 to see how much they generate. If they generate a positive value, I have to add it in. If it generates a negative value, that just means they're big enough to capture more than they need to. So both Bailey and Lot 1 are a little on the big side. They capture a little bit extra, right? They could capture another 58 or 52 cubic meters of water. So I could ignore them in summing downstream. But nonetheless, I then have to, when I look at the biochem, say, what does the biochem do, right? Biochem, it has an extra 221 overflow that it creates. I have to add that to the 203, so there's about 400 and 25 extra cubic meters at the biochem. Same thing down here then for the Gortner. Does the Gortner ramp have any extra capacity, right? The Gortner doesn't. It creates 73. So now I'm up over 300. That's extra coming down, right? Then I have brown one and brown two. And brown one has a capacity of 163. So I have the 300 and some minus the 163 that's going to come out there. So I'm down to about 140. And brown 2 is 478. So it's basically at 478 by 140. So this brown 2 is bigger than it needs to be. I could make this smaller then, call it good, because these aren't that much too big, and then go on to my next analysis. I would make it smaller and maybe rerun the thing, the, the model, calculate my amount of water that comes out, and then um, calculate the costs for each of these. Then I would rerun it with a 5 centimeter analysis. Now with a 5 centimeter rainfall, I know I'm going to have to change a lot of things. Green roofs if I can. I can make these bigger if I have space. Um, and maybe resize this back to the size. But the idea is to get an idea of how big these are and then be careful about tracing overflows and surpluses without running through a bunch of times. Whatever you do, don't put in a a rain garden and run it and put and say, oh, that's not big enough and put it in another rain garden and then run it again and say, oh, it's still not big enough and put it in another rain garden and run it again. We just want you to get comfortable with the workflow and do this sort of complicated analysis, um, some manually and some, uh, some most of it using the ArcGIS tools. So that's it for now.